Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 143 and 142, which read as follows. Hiri nise dho puriso kochi lokasmi vijjati yo nidhang appabodheti asso badro kasami va asso yatha badro kasani vitto Atapino sangvegino bhavata sadhaya sirena cha viriena cha samadhina dhamma vinicca yena cha Sampanna vijja charana patisata chahisata dukkha midang anapakang Quite a mouthful. The meaning of which are 143 Hirinisido Puriso, a human, a, a, a person who is held back by uh, shame, the shame being the aversion to bad deeds, the aversion towards unwholesomeness, being disinclined to unwholesomeness. Kochi Lokas Mingwijati, whatever person in the world is found to be this way, restrained by understanding that bad deeds are bad, wrong. What is wrong is wrong. Yonidang apabodheti. Now this is an interesting one. It could mean who awakens from sleep, or it could mean who uh, avoids, doesn't awaken uh, ninda, which if it uh, doesn't awaken censure and reproach like a horse to the whip, so it's either a horse, uh, like a thoroughbred horse, either a thoroughbred horse avoids um, the need to use the whip, or else they awaken because of the whip. I'm not sure which one it is. Either, either translation seems to me, I actually prefer the second one, um, awakening from sleep, like the horse, the whip, right? Or the, like the horse does when whipped, so when a horse, a horse awakens because they're whipped, just a, a person awakens from their state of sleep. But it could also be nindang, which would mean anyway something totally different. The point is, uh, don't sleep and don't uh, do not do that which is worthy of censure, one or the other. 144, who is touched by the whip, the, the like the horse that is the thoroughbred horse that is touched by the whip. Atapi no one should have effort. Sangwegi no one should be um, urgent. Let's have a sense of urgency. Bawata. Become one who is effortful, or be one who is effortful, or cultivate effort and a sense of urgency. With faith, with confidence, eff uh, ethics, and effort, sadaya silena chaviriyena cha, samadina with concentration, dhammavini chayena cha with a discernment or uh, making an understanding about the dhamma, deciding based on the dhamma, making decisions based on the dhamma. Sampanna vijja charana, being fully endowed with uh, knowledge and conduct. Patisata, mindful, or being one who is devoted to. Jahisata, avoiding, jahisata dukkha midhanga napakanga, you avoid, may you avoid this suffering which is not insignificant. If that's uh, complicated, it's a little bit, but there's many things in there, so we'll try and go through those. The first verse is relating to describing a person who is uh, like a horse, like a thoroughbred horse, because they either don't inspire the use of the whip, or when they are whipped, they know what to do, they react appropriately. And like such a person, you should cultivate 
uh, you should be awake, cultivate effort, and a sense of urgency, and so on. That's the verse. The story behind this is an actually a short but fairly memorable story of uh, a young lad who was wearing a, uh, a simple loincloth uh, as a beggar, you know, one of these people, you know, fair, very destitute, that, that all they have is a, a simple bowl, a begging bowl and one piece of cloth to their name that's dirty and sullied and it's all they've got to cover their bodies with. Someone in a fairly desperate situation. And Ananda saw him one day and said to him, "Hey, don't you, you know? Don't you? Wouldn't? What, what do you think? Wouldn't it be better to become a monk? Wouldn't becoming a monk be better than this life?" And he said, "Well, well who will ordain me?" I said, "Come along, I'll ordain you." So he took him with him, bathed him, and uh, taught him meditation and made a monk of him. It gave him the requisites and so on and uh, turned him into a monk and and this new monk looked at his old his old rags and uh, you know, spread it out and tried to f and looked at it and it was so sullied so awful that there was not even a little bit of it that he could use for straining water because they would use cloth for straining water but it was so disgusting that there was no part of it but he couldn't give it up and so he bundled it up with his old little uh, begging bowl or whatever and put it up in the crook of a tree and went on so eventually he was uh, made a full monk and he was uh, given all the wonderful accoutrements involved with being a Buddhist monk at the time which meant he would have great robes and 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 food and and lodging and, and quite, a, quite, lux quite a bit of luxury. Once Buddhism became famous, the monks were subject to a great amount of, um, well, of uh, comfort. And as a result, he became complacent and fat, apparently, and eventually became discontent, because he didn't really see what the point of all this was. And it felt kind of, I guess, like uh, being fake. And he thought, well, I should just go back to the, my old way, you know, not have to get involved with this this thing that I don't really understand or believe in, or do it, you know, doing it just to get fat. I mean, what is really this is really kind of hypocritical of me. I should you know, go back to how I was. And so he went back to the tree and found this old rag and pulled it down. And then he thought about that, and he thought, you know, this is what I've left behind this this life of destitution and poverty this life of suffering. I can't do that. And so he went back and tried again, but he, you know, he felt like he wasn't really doing what he should be doing as a monk. He wasn't really meditating or, or behaving properly. And So again he felt kind of bad about it. And Again he went back to the tree and, and picked up the robe, but the cloth, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He just looked at this cloth and said, you know, this is, this is not the way. And three times he, did, he went back and forth, and the monks eventually started to see this and asked him, you know, where are you going? He said, oh, I'm going to see my teacher. And I go, oh, okay. And again and again he went back until finally, or eventually, you know, contemplating this and contemplating in general, you know, because it, it makes that kind of thing makes you somewhat philosophical and you think, you know, what is, what really is the point to any of this? He started to see and to take this cloth, which would be a very good object of meditation, a solid, and it's, it's, a, it's the, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the symbol of, samsara really with its filth and its representing the, the need to seek out food and the need to clothe your body you know, just what it represents it represents the suffering the potential for destitution that that, that awaits us you know, at every turn that we can fall into and eventually doing this he actually was able to apply himself 
he would go back and he would try to meditate and then he wouldn't be able to and he would go back to his cloth and again and again until finally he just let go. And he became an arahant from, I guess, listening to the Buddha's teaching as well and having this great teacher in this rag robe. And so eventually he, he became an arahant and then, and then immediately stopped. He, he no longer would return to this uh, tree where he kept this robe. And the monks asked him, you know, aren't you going to see your teacher? What, what happened? And he said, oh, he said, well, bef before I, when I was attached to the world, then I, I, wa I needed a teacher, but now that I'm, uh, I've cut off all ties, I don't need a teacher anymore. And they thought to themselves, well, this is, this is quite the boast. And so they went to the teacher and they said, you know, this monk goes around saying something that's not true. You know? And the Buddha said, well, what did he say? And he said, well, he, he says, he used to walk with a teacher, now he has no attachments, he's, not, he's cut all the ties, so he doesn't need a teacher anymore, which is basically saying he's enlightened. And the Buddha said, well, yes, that's true. He, he, uh, and he called him my son. When my son was attached to the world, then he needed a teacher. And so the Buddha didn't reveal what he knew about, about it being a, a robe that he went back to. He said, well, he needed a teacher before, but now he... He has restrained himself, and he no longer needs someone else to restrain him. And so then he taught these two verses. So we have two lessons here. We have the lesson from the story, and we have the lesson from the verses, or a couple of lessons maybe from the verses. But the story is interesting in, in how it, it gives an example of how the world can be your teacher, how inanimate objects can teach you so much, you know, inanimate objects that mean something things that we, 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 pers we uh, ascribe meaning to. I mean, there's great meaning in the cloth, as I said. And it represents his life. You know, it represents life. It represents suffering. And, uh, and, and that's it, you know, kind of important, our ability to comprehend the uh, potential for suffering in the world. The Buddha would often talk about uh, our ability to recognize the suffering in life, recognize the potential that we too will get old, we too will get sick, we too will die, we too could suffer destitution, poverty, hunger, thirst, you know, um, any, any number of, of types of suffering. And so it, it really it evokes in us this, this questioning of why and, and and how do I escape? And what is the right way to, to go? You know, what is the right thing to do? So we begin to question these things that we took for granted and say, you know, really, is that all that there is? Is that the best that I can do? Is this life, is this really the right way to go? You know, to live my life as though everything was all right. To live my life as though I, I would never fall into that. For this man, it was... Uh, you know, it was quite a visceral um, you know, insight for him to to have this object that will constantly remind him of his potential to fall right back into suffering, you know, and a reminder of what life, how harsh life can be. But then, on the other hand, he's like, you know, I can't just take advantage of this being a monk or staying as a monk. And that's what most of us do, right? We take advantage of our good fortune. We take advantage of having money and having family and having possessions. When all of these things could disappear in a heartbeat. In many cases, we don't even deserve them. We haven't done anything, not, not, or we aren't doing anything to, to deserve them. And so these this sorts of things were what, would, what he would contemplate. And it's a good contemplation for all of us. This is a very good example, right? may not seem like it, we're not all beggars living on the street, but we live in this dilemma of, of um, falling asleep, really, in being lulled into a false sense of security. And uh, you know, the, the, the inevitable fall back into suffering and poverty and, and whatever. So I think that's a good lesson for us, a good reminder. It's not a meditation practice, but uh, it certainly supports our meditation. Because as a result, we, we 
come to see that you know, the only way is to change our minds and to be in, uh, invincible, to be unmovable, unmoved by the vicissitudes of life, the changes, the potential, because we can't stop, we can't control the, the future. And if that's the way we choose to go, we'll always be disappointed when things change in ways that we're not comfortable with. So that's, I think, the first lesson here. The second lesson, the, the lesson from the verse is perhaps more applicable directly to meditation. The first one is, well, the first verse is, is I guess, really the same sort of lesson as the story, is the ability to wake up, waking up when we remember the suffering of life. Every time this man went back to the tree, he would remember how, how unpleasant it was being uh, in his situation. And uh, so this is a sign of, of a good person. That The Buddha said it's like the sign of a thoroughbred horse, is that when they see the whip, they know what to do. Or when they feel the whip, at least then they know what to do. But the same with a human. When they hear about people suffering, they know what to do. They know that something needs to be done to avoid that, to avoid the suffering associated with change, with loss, and so on. And th therefore they develop themselves, they cultivate good things, and so on. Um, just like a... It's just like waking from sleep or avoiding the blame that comes from it. Not sure which. But the second verse, 144, is really quite. Uh, it's probably one of the f one of the most pithy of the Dhammapada verses. It's because it's finally talking about a whole bunch of good qualities. So, what are the qualities like? The qualities of a thoroughbred horse. What are the qualities of a thoroughbred meditator? A meditator who is high, who is special, who is, is exceptional. Adapino. They cultivate effort. No. They they exert themselves. They don't just laze around doing nothing. They get up and they do the walking and the sitting and the mindful. They they wake up their minds really. They have the effort of mind to repeatedly attend to the meditation object. Sangwegi know why? Because Sangwega they have a sense of urgency. They realize that this this could come tomorrow. Change could come at any time, and change is, is the only constant. And I'm not ready for that. I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not at peace with that. And so they, they have a sense of urgency that they're going to suffer if they don't do this. Sadaya, with, with confidence. So they have confidence in what they're doing. They find a path that is worthy of confidence. And then they have confidence, because it's also possible to doubt that which is worthy of confidence. You can find the right path and see that it gives you good results and still end up doubting it, which is a pretty sad state, but it's quite common. Because it, Why? Because doubt is a, is a habit. Doubt is, has nothing to, do with, nothing to do potentially with what you're doing. It's our reaction when things get difficult. It's a defense mechanism in many cases stops us from having to do things that um, bring about suffering. So we should be, we should let go of our doubt when we found that which we know is beneficial. Silena, we should have ethics, we should avoid bad thoughts or bad deeds, bad speech. We should work to cultivate ethics to, so that our mind stays focused, so that our mind is not distracted by all the unethical behaviors that we've engaged in. Viriyena, again, with viriya, effort. Samadhina, with concentration or focus, keeping our minds focused, not letting our minds get distracted, bringing the mind back again and again to attend on the, on the truth, on reality. Dhamma-vinichayena, with... Um, Dhamma-vinichaya, vinichaya means... Um, giving an answer, or no, ex ex investigating, or uh, understanding, maybe. Vinichaya. 
discrimination may be the better translation. So the ability to discriminate, this is good, this is bad, this is uh, profitable, unprofitable, helpful, unhelpful, useful, unuseful. Ability to see, because when you look inside, you'll start to see those aspects, those behaviors, those habits that we have uh, that are beneficial, that are to our benefit and, and that are helpful to the others as well. And then we can see those which are detrimental. Sampanavija Jarna, so being fully endowed with uh, not only knowledge, so knowing the truth, but also acting accordingly. Vija Jarna is a good, good definition of, of Buddhist wisdom. It's the type of wisdom that involves practice as, as well, that is really about who you are, not just what you believe or what you think. Wisdom is not just thinking or believing something. Wisdom is knowing it to such an extent that it penetrates into your own behavior, who you are. It's about how you act and how you behave. It's not about what you believe or what you think. Patisata, I think, means uh, being mindful. Either that or just, yeah, no, I think it means being mindful. Like patisati, we have in the Satipatthana Sutta. So a specific type of mindfulness. Pati sati, pati means specifically. So it's like being just mindful, barely mindful, not judging, not reacting. That might be what it means. Jahisata dukkamidang anapakang. You will avoid this great mass of suffering, the suffering which is not just a little bit. The great suffering you avoid. Suffering which is not insignificant. So you could argue that you can't totally be free from suffering, right? There are There is pain and there is um, unpleasant situations that you have to be faced with. But there's a huge, a, a much greater suffering in the mind. And the greatest part of suffering is not in the great wide world out there that is terrible and, and fearsome and a cause for so much uh, upset. But uh, the great mass of suffering is actually in this little uh, invisible corner of the universe that is our mind. You know, this very simple, uh, simple thing, simple reality of our own mind. That it's just one moment after another. It's where all the suffering goes. So you get an intense amount of stress and suffering and, and the great torture that we put ourselves through. It has nothing to do, actually, with the outside world. No matter what happens, gain or loss, praise or blame, no matter what good things or bad things come, no matter what terrible things might happen, no matter how bad things might get, our suffering has really nothing to do with any of that. The greater part of suffering will always come from our own mind, come from our bad habits and our lack of good qualities, our inability to penetrate each experience with wisdom and to see it clearly as it is. As a result, instead, we misjudge, misunderstand, and react inappropriately to all of our experiences and suffer as a result. Not as a result of the experiences themselves, but as a result of our reactions to them. So that's the lesson for us. Cultivating all these things, cultivating effort, and a sense of urgency. And we have to work at it. I mean, it's a good reminder for us. But this isn't something that it isn't a chore that we're obliged to do. It's an escape. It's a way out. If you practice in this way, a great amount of suffering you will be free from. So that's the Dhammapada for this evening. Thank you all for tuning in. Wishing you all good practice. <laughs>